Thank you very much. It's good to be back. Hello, everyone from my side. So it started a little shaky today, but we fixed it. I got my presentation. Um, so my topic today is political risk analysis in times of fake news and blurring narratives. What does it mean? First of all, I would like to start to take you on, on a journey of my um, observation. I think we're living in an ever more globalized world where everything is fluid and interconnected. Fake news and blurring narratives make it even harder to see clear and to build a clear strategy based on the information you collect. Is it either for your company as a business or you are working for government authority where you also have to, based on all the information you can get, take your decisions. I can skip this one um, because I was greatly introduced. Uh, the only thing I wanted to say is that my goal is to help people to understand the forces and narratives that are reshaping our world by providing engaging coverage about global affairs, delivering regional expert insights, and pushing beyond predictable opinions. I think that we have to accept the unknown unknowns I don't know if you are familiar with this concept. Um, there are things we certainly cannot know. Even the, the greatest expert will not know. And concentrate on the obvious. And only if you listen and also be empathic and, and try to understand the other side, then we can create a, a less risky world and I think a better world. Um, I don't want to bother you long with, with uh, definitions, but we have to go through this um, words I put in the title and it sounds like buzzwords, you know, it sounds fancy, but we have to see what's behind. So what's political risk analysis? It's the analysis of the probability that political decisions, events, or conditions will significantly affect the prof prof profitability of a business um, or the expected value of a given business decision. And we have all kinds of sources, like we have madman um, risk and we have natural disasters, we have regulation, um, be it in employment, uh, be it in, in, in health, um, we have tariffs, we have uh, trade quotas, and so on and so on. We can have um, a shaky political um, situation in, in any given country, we can have a coup d'etat. Um, I mean, you, you all know, I don't have to tell you. Um, so with the political risk analysis, we aim to provide insights into areas of the political process in which a business needs to intervene if it wants to change the business environment, mitigate its potential risks, or maximize its opportunities. It shall also allow early warning systems in the management of major uh, risks. Um, I, gave you, I give you one um, example um, from a country where I used to work as a, as a business consultant. It's Qatar. Uh, the Emirate of Qatar, which is a very li tiny little country um, in, in the Arab Gulf region, was part of the Gulf Cooperation Council, and right now is blockaded um, by its uh, Arab, uh, uh, Arab brother states. So what we did there, we introduced a, a German um, small, medium-sized uh, company um, which was active in, in, in water management uh, on construction sites. And we figured that um, while in Qatar they write it in every vision that they want to um, use the state-of-the-art technologies and only the greenest ones. Um, if, if you look how reality looks like at construction sites or what the general um, contractor goes for is sometimes the cheapest solution because it's a market, market question. So we couldn't compete with the German company against uh, our South Korean and Chinese uh, competitors. So we were able to to uh, lobby with, with government authorities that they raise the, the guidelines, what you can, um, what you can channel into the, the groundwater system from the construction site. So that was a success and we did it. But then we figured out that no one controlled the new standards. So we had to work again and um, make sure that uh, they check on the construction sites that the new, um, the new levels and the new um, uh, regulations are, yeah, uh, that, that people actually um, approve this, the new system. Um, this is only one, one um, 
example, I would like to tell you how you could have also an advantage. If you know the system, if you know the political system, if you know how to play it, and you, you maybe are not only prepared if something comes up and you don't only react, but you can proactively um, shape um, the, maybe the, the legal situation or try to help and come with solutions. Fake news and blurring narratives. Fake news, I think it's not new, but the, the quality is new. And we all know the, the Twitter war of Trump. I mean, he tries to shape narratives. And I think after all, what he did is ki kind of smart because he let his f Republican friends buy the media outlets from the Re Republicans, so Fox News, etc. Then he blames the Democratic part of the media fake news and say they are evil and they don't tell the truth. The third thing, he, he didn't stop there. The third thing what he did is he starts to Twitter himself. And I don't know if it's true or not. I mean, I think he has a team, but also I think that he really Twitters himself. And it's, it's, a, it's a smart strategy because not for you and me here in this room, but for the average citizen. I mean, if he gets a, 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 a Twitter tweet and maybe he thinks or tells to his friends, that's the president, you know? I mean, if, the pre if not the president, who would know better? He's our leader. And for 50% of the people who voted for him, it makes sense. And I think um, th this is an uh, underestimated, um, also an underestimated risk, and everyone thinks that there is no strategy in his actions. I actually think so. The, the second um, problem is that um, the media system, I mean, we have the major media uh, um, outlets in the US, maybe also in London, in Paris, we also have it here in Germany. But in, in Europe, the, the media landscape is under a lot of pressure. It's scared resources when it comes to money, when it comes to, 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 to journalists to hire, to make good in investigative journalism. A lot goes to the social media where everything is in, in real-time communication, very fast, people only react. And, and here the, the possible impact is and the risk um, that fake news gets spread in, in a very, very fast time is, is even higher. Again, an example from the Gulf states. Um, you maybe all know the, the Qatar crisis, which started in June 5th, 2017, so it's going on for a while. It's a full blockade by air, sea, and land. Um, but before that, I mean, it, it's a new level, but bef before that, there were inter interferences between the Arab Gulf states and the, the Saudis and Emiratis. They spend a lot of money in Washington, D.C. for lobbyists, and um, sometimes major media here in Germany, they just copy-pasted what they found in, in the US media without checking it. So the, what I want to say here is you don't even have to influence the German media system. You just go after the big guys in the US, and then it triggers through, and it, it, it spreads in the whole world. Um, I want to say neutral here. I mean, like all the Gulf states take, they, they have a lot of PR budgets, and I think any country who can afford it tries to influence uh, uh, the media system and tries to, which is all legitimate, to, to s tell the story about your country, to shape a narrative. Um, you can do it with, with cultural diplomacy. You can do it with PR and media marketing um, instruments. Um, why did I take this example? It shows, a much, uh, it shows much, uh, how much influence and harm lobby groups can have or cause to government and businesses. It stresses the weak points of today's media system. It's a prime uh, example how regional interfer interferences and voids can cause harm for every company, which has business interests in all the GCC countries. Because they were asked, um, what's your preferred place of business? So if you want to do business in, let's say, the Saudi market, you cannot have an uh, office in Doha anymore. Which is not a, um, a big problem for the big shots, like the blue chip companies, because they're so powerful they wouldn't play this political game. And they have, uh, they have solution and products everyone wants to. So you cannot tell them you have to decide either in my market or another market. But um, all these small and medium-sized enterprises, and in Germany, it's the backbone, backbone of our economy. Almost 90% are SMEs. So these small businesses, they have a problem because they are under pressure. And so coming back to political risk analysis, 
you can ask yourself if you if you're actually able to not foresee these developments but at least have insider knowledge and maybe an advantage because you can prepare yourself for such a situation doesn't mean that you don't have to take hard decisions but you are at least ready mm. so working with a political risk analysis or a company and most of the the big companies have it in-house smaller ones may they externalize it and they give it to an expert i always tell my clients but it's difficult rather give me the money and, and hire me then losing a lot of money afterwards because you have to pay lawyers you, you have to pay tax consultants you have to shift maybe your business and you can o avoid most of it if you are prepared and if you base your decision on on insider knowledge which can only be it's a full-time job i say because and you cannot do it on the side like you need a whole team which is investigating with different instruments be it qualitative or quantitative measures the conclusions many companies do not see the necess necessity to hire political risk analysis um, and also in terms of the available knowledge even the greatest expert gets more stupid um, that, that's what my phd supervisor always said and he graduated he got his phd in in uh, he, he wrote about chinese military policy in the year i was born 1985. so you can imagine that uh, writing a phd from here but he was fluent in mandarin was very difficult to gather or get any information out of this communist system but he said nowadays maybe it's easier because you have this vast um, en endless amounts of, of knowledge but what is key now is to reduce complexity and to really see what is important and what is not important and what is important for me and that's it i want to end so the i have five minutes but i rather would give it to the to the question and answers thank you Any questions? Yes, in the back. I think one of the biggest factories of uh, fake messages, mm -hmm. um, especially for the political uh, system and the election was India. Because we might say Trump and we might say the US, mm -hmm. but two years before that, it began with India. And especially uh, when the Modi government came inside, they started off with this. And more than affecting the political leaders, it's there are advertising firms who do this or who come up with these strategies. And today, what began in India has gone to the US. And there is a saying that I think there are talks, theories that Russia is also getting involved. Mm -hmm. And it's happening almost in every country's political uh, elections which are upcoming. Mm -hmm. so. It's a good point. I cannot really add something because I'm not an, an expert in, in India. Yeah. And with the Indian election coming, once again, the same thing which began in 2013, mm -hmm. because, it, because India is the world's biggest democracy. So I know. There it began. And then the same thing was the same style of politics with fake messages. It was enacted in the US election with the same style of, style of hardline politics as well. And may I ask you, what's your analysis? Why is this the case? I mean, what, what are the, the crucial factors? It's, that's, that's where, like, because, like, it's polarizing people, and then polarizing people with fake messages. Because most of the people are masses. Masses get influenced by the social media. Because nobody ascertains how much is the truth they can draw. For example, I get a message. Right now, I think India and Pakistan are on the verge of a war. Mm. Now, there's a lot of hatred which is just artificially brought inside mm. by these kinds of fake messages. Now, who's doing it? It's done by these advertising firms who are paid huge. Now, obviously, I think the uh, Facebook, uh, I think the, the Cambridge Analytica, the one. Cam yeah, Cambridge Analytica. One came out. There are many such advertising firms which are doing it, and that's now that's become a business. Mm. Today, when elections are coming inside, that's a business where, like, they're just pushing in strategies to polarize people and influence elections and then win. 
Exactly. It is a big business and many people make a lot of money with it. And that's the challenge in fact, but you have to, to deal with it. And I would like to ask you as an audience, maybe um, some of you work in government authorities or represent the government. Others are in, in businesses or in cultural activities. So how do you guys gather your information? And on what information do you take your decisions? Is it just the your media, your, your your newsletters, and but also I think what is absolutely necessary is to have face-to-face -face conversation under four eyes. Like no one will, and even there, most of the people will maybe tell you a certain information, but you always have to ask why is this guy telling me this? You know, what do I do with this information? So is there is there any comment from your side? Please. Hey, um, I'm Frank. I'm from the United States. Hi, Frank. Uh, I'm a master's student here at ICD, so I can't really speak to a lot of the, the higher roles that need this information. But for me, with, with all the fake news, the, the key thing is uh, amalgamating news, is using a lot of different sources, and going into those sources knowing what the biases are and trying to discern the bias, and then trying to take the average opinion of all the sources to come up with a roughly cohesive on an issue. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, I like to comment, I, I, I will agree with this kind of the fake news. I have been working, so I have been for a while. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, we are talking about fake news. I, I would like to point out, which is funny because we are, for, uh, we are talking about fake news like something new or recent thanks to the social network. And we don't realize the social net, uh, fake news has been since the beginning of human society. One of the main results of that, for example, is religion or even nationalism is the result of fake news. Because at the end, religions and nationalism somehow are fake news, you know? And that's the point. Uh, it's when the first guy who is a little bit smarter meets the first that ne doesn't know anything or not as much. So I don't know, maybe it's an old problem that I would like to know <coughs> how we can face it since we have been struggling since the beginning. And yeah, they are, at the end, they end up in Tax avoiding society, mm. the real tech companies, it could be the Vatican or whatever uh, other, you know. I, I agree with you. Um, and I also pointed out that I think it's not it's not nothing new and it was around before. Um, but what I also think is that that the White House, the establishment in, in the US um, uses it so clearly. Is it, is it, I mean, fake bots and, and, and all of this was around Russian interference into European affairs, Chinese interference. This was around before Trump. But I think that Trump saw the, this chance and used it as a strategy and blamed uh, his, his adversaries. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause. Thank you.